My name is Rahil Raza. I, I was born in Pakistan. Uh, I am a Canadian citizen and I am an activist for women's rights, for human rights. Uh, I'm accredited with the United Nations Human Rights Council where I go to uh, present issues that deal with human rights uh, abuses. Uh, I'm a journalist, I'm a public speaker, I'm a documentary filmmaker and a grandmother. <laughs> well, since um, many people think that feminism was born in the West, they presume that Muslim women cannot be feminists. So a Muslim feminist is a, a woman who wants liberation of her mind and soul. It has very little to do with the physical manifestation. It is the idea that you need to be liberated and have individual freedom, which is what I have found when I came to the West, is the idea of individual thinking, individual freedom, and you know the freedom of thought and action and freedom of speech. Uh, yes, I could. You'd have to have me here for a long time. But, <laughs> but uh, briefly, um, about 30 years ago, uh, there was an invasion of an ideology which is not the kind of Islam that I grew up with. In Pakistan, when I was growing up, it was a pluralistic society. You know, I studied in a Catholic school. I did my university through a Catholic college. So there was a lot of intermingling of people of different faiths and cultures, and it was a very uh, mellow kind of a society. We had music, we, you know, you could be whoever you were, and religion was not thrust down your throat. And then in the late 1970s, we had uh, the uh, sort of invasion of an ideology from Saudi Arabia called Wahhabism. And Wahhabism is like a curse. Uh, Wahhabism is a virus that has inflected uh, a large majority of the Muslim world. And it is a very dogmatic, hardcore, violent interpretation of Islam. And it has been exported from Saudi Arabia on the backs of billions of petrodollars. And it is an ideology that my family and I left behind in Pakistan to come and find democracy, freedom, and separation of church and state in the West. But it has now followed us to the West as well. What it has done in the last 30 years is that it has infected the minds of our youth with an idea that the West is bad and the West needs to be harmed. And so this is a, is, um, a kind of a manipulation of their brains, a kind of a brainwashing. And there is an entire generation, the, the young people who have gone to Syria and Iraq to fight the jihad with ISIS, for example. Uh, this is not something that the, you know, I see as a part of the spiritual message of the faith that I grew up. So about 10 years ago, I used to say that my faith has been hijacked. Today I say that it has been stolen and replaced with this ideology that is evil, that is barbaric, that is very anti-women. So a large part of my work incorporates uh, issues of women's rights in the Muslim world. Um, I'll have to explain this to you sort of a, a little bit at length. You know, yeah. the word Islam means submission to the will of God. So it's really an adjective. It is a state of mind. It is a state of life. What, uh, what um, motivates Islam is the Quran, which is our scripture, which we consider to be the word of God. I, what I believe is that our understanding of that needs, definitely needs a reform. How we implement Islam in our lives, how we implement the Quran, how we live our lives as Muslims definitely needs a huge reform. And that is something that we need to sow the seeds of right now. Because you know that reform is not easy. It's not something that happens overnight. The Christian reform took many hundreds of years. And so we, um, uh, we, we are just uh, sowing the seeds of that reform right now. And definitely the understanding of the faith, the implementation of the faith needs a reform, but it can't be done by people like me, even though I'm an activist. It has to be done by scholars and religious leaders. And all we can do is light a fire under their feet and help them with the movement. It is so important for young people to have knowledge of uh, their faith to get the history and the heritage of their faith. 
because it's not just what somebody tells them. Unfortunately, many of our young people have been brought up to believe that they should, you know, not, should not read for themselves, that they should not question. They must quench question because it is out of doubt that you get the most certainty. So young people need to ask questions. They need to say, is violence part of my faith? Let me go find out if it is or not. And, and understand for themselves, they need to educate themselves about the faith and they need to un look at it in a historical background. You know, it's taken me years to do that myself. And part of the work that I do with my organization called Muslims Facing Tomorrow is try to help uh, young people that Islam does not have to live in the seventh century. You know, it needs to be a modern, uh, compelling, vibrant faith, and it can be. You know, it, it needs to, to be compatible with the 21st century. Just like our computers and our tel cell phones need to be compatible, you know, and, and they change all the time. Similarly, we need to bring it into the 21st century. Well, I was always asked this question about uh, Muslim women can't be feminists. And I used to wonder why, why, why not? Uh, you know, 1400 years ago, uh, the prophet who, who brought the message of Islam was sent a proposal of marriage by the woman he married and he used to work for her and she was older than him. I mean, to me, that is feminism at its core. So I decided that I wanted to prove that yes, Muslim women are feminists, but it's about liberation of the mind and soul. And so this book is called, How Could You Possibly Be a Muslim Feminist? Thank you so much for coming and doing this interview with us. Thank you.